All right, good morning, Clarksburg Baptist Church. It is so great to have you here in church with us today. Uh, so great to see all of your smiling faces beneath your masks. I believe you're smiling at me. Are you smiling at me? Or am I just making that up? Okay. <laughs> uh, our online audience, we're so thankful that you have decided to tune in and join us for church as well. We have an awesome service ahead of us today. If you would go ahead and like the live stream and share this out for all your friends and your family and your coworkers and anybody that we could get connected with to let them know, hey, you can belong here with us. Uh, we have some exciting things to uh, go over this morning. First of all, our kids cookout. Anybody with kids or kids volunteers, we welcome you to come out and invite some other people as well. We're going to be uh, meeting at the Rorba's house next Saturday on May 22nd. We did change the time to uh, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. due to some unforeseen circumstances. So uh, if you're interested in coming out there and bringing some food as well, uh, get contacted with me sometime at the end of the service or this week, and we will get you marked down for something that you can bring as well. Uh, we have our uh, annual business meeting is coming up uh, here at CBC on May 26th at 6.30 p.m. in the sanctuary. This is a great opportunity for members of the church to come out, hear updates about the various ministries and commissions. Uh, we need you here. We're going to be right here in the sanctuary. That's going to start at 6.30 on May 26th. And lastly, child dedications, we will be having them on Sunday, June 20th. We were going to have them at the end of this month. We ended up pushing that back as well. So if you're a member of CBC and you want to have your child dedicated, uh, get with us. Please contact the church office sometime during the week. Send Val an email, and we will get you down for that. And also, our Above and Beyond offering, we wanted to thank you for your generous giving through the month of April. We gave uh, $1,338 that will be used by the West Virginia Baptist Convention for their ministries like Camp Cowan and Baptist Campus Ministries and different things like that. So let's just give a round of applause. That is an awesome thing. Hey, your generosity is, uh, is just absolutely amazing, and ministry can't happen without it, and uh, we are just so thankful for you guys. Now, so excited. We are about to recognize our graduating seniors. Okay, so we, I will be calling uh, seniors up one by one. When you come up, if you would please stay on stage. That way we can get a group picture of everybody uh, at the end of our um, announcing you. Uh, we do have a couple of gifts for you, and when you come up on stage, uh, feel free to take your mask off to come up just this once, because I'm sure your family may want to take pictures, and, uh, but if you don't feel comfortable taking your mask off, that's fine as well. So, let's see. We have, who do we have first? Rebecca Williams. Is Becca in the house yet? There she is. Becca is graduating from... Uh, RCB, and she plans to attend WVU this fall to study forensic science and maybe even switch to nursing. Becca, we're so proud of you. There you can move. Uh, next, we have Miss Sam Carley. There's Sam. Sam is also graduating from RCB. She'll be attending the University of Washington in Seattle for a bachelor's degree in psychology, and she hopes to further that into a doctorate. We're proud of you, Sam. Next, we have Miss Emily McPherson, who is graduating from Liberty. Emily will be attending WVU in the fall uh, with Direct Admit Pathway Program to the School of Pharmacy. Emily, it's awesome. We're super proud of you. Next, we have Patrick Fubio. Patrick is also graduating from RCB. Uh, he plans to attend Fairmont State University in the fall to major in biology and swim and continue to break records. Next, we have Ms. Paige Humble. There's Paige. Paige plans to attend uh, Glenville State, where she'll be playing basketball and studying criminal justice and forensics, and she is graduating from Bridgeport High. Next, we have Madison Watson. Madison is graduating from Liberty as well. 
and will be attending uh, WVU in the fall. Uh, Timothy Murphy, we want to give him a big round of applause, but he is not with us. We'll have to get with him later. But uh, Timothy uh, is graduating from RCB as well, and he will be attending Liberty to pursue a future in ministry. So we're excited about that. And lastly, we have Miss Colby Williams, who uh, also couldn't be with us today, but she is uh, graduating from RCB, and she's going to be attending Fairmont State University in the fall to become an oncology nurse. So let's give it up for Colby Williams. We are so, so, so thankful for each of you. We're so proud of you uh, in your, uh, as you begin your future endeavors and your journeys. Uh, we wanted to let you guys know a couple of the things that we were able to give them. Uh, we have each of them a book that also has a gift card in it for Amazon. Uh, but more importantly, we were excited for the second year to uh, give them this word cloud of a graduation cap. And uh, what this is, Beck is showing it off for you guys. <laughs> uh, what this is, we got with uh, the parents of all of these seniors and said, hey, if you can just get with, yeah, you guys flip them around. Let's show, you, you're going to have to take the book off them, but let's show them to everybody. So what we did is we got with uh, the parents of all these graduating seniors, and we had them reach out to people in your lives, coaches, teachers, friends, family, mentors, people who've been there to support you all along the journey, and we asked them to give a few descriptive words about you. So uh, all of the words that you see in your cap are words that people wanted to affirm in you and to say about you as you complete this journey of your life and move into the next. So uh, anytime you need those affirmations and you just want to know what people think about you, that's it right there for people who love you and people who support you. So uh, yeah, go ahead and flip it around. Let's go ahead and get a picture if you want to take a picture. Wonderful smiles. A couple more pictures. We're good? All right, let's give it up for our graduating seniors. You guys are free to go. We are going to uh, pray for them in just a moment. I also wanted to give a quick shout out to some uh, college graduates. We don't have, uh, we're not going to be welcoming you on stage or anything, but hey, you're still important. You still matter. And we're still excited about your life achievements. Uh, so just a few of those we wanted to mention. First is uh, Julia Harbaugh, who's, I don't think, with us today, but uh, she just graduated from Fairmont State University with a Bachelor's of Science in Psychology. Let's give it up for Julia wherever she's watching. And staying in the family, we want to recognize Connie Harbaugh, who just uh, graduated her, her um, Advanced General Studies through the West Virginia Baptist Convention. Let's give it up for Connie. Also with us today, I'm going to make her stand up, is Emily Deneen. I don't know where she's at. I saw her walk in, though. There's Emily. Emily just graduated from uh, Fairmont State and is going to con uh, continue her education on the path to become a PA. Is that right? I got it. I got it right. Uh, and then also we have uh, Marissa Watson, who just uh, graduated from WVU uh, very early, apparently, is, is what I'm hearing, with a Bachelor's of Arts in English. So let's give it up for Marissa as well. Man, it's so exciting to be able to celebrate so many people this morning, uh, different life achievements as they wrap up one journey and move on to the next thing. So uh, I'm asking you to be in prayer for these people. Uh, the graduating seniors, the, uh, those who are graduating college, uh, because they have more life ahead of them. They have uh, so much more to do, and we can continue to be an amazing support system for them. Uh, so can, uh, join me in praying for them this morning. God, we thank you so much for uh, who you are. God, we thank you for the plans that you have put into each of our lives. Thank you for the gifts and the talents that you've bestowed upon these seniors. God, I pray that you would just help them to realize they have one life and they need to uh, do what really matters in this life. I pray that you would just uh, be glorified and honored in all that they do as they continue to seek your will and uh, your plans and purposes for their life. And God, I pray that you would just give us uh, just the wisdom to pour out on them. Help us to be a strong support system full of love and grace 
and encouragement as they continue. We thank you for all that you do, Lord. Amen. Stand and sing to our great God today.
Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by every stone, Messiah still in all the Oh, <laughs> 
silly cook-off a couple of years ago. I was so excited. Any chili fans in here? I love a good, a good bowl of chili, okay? I was asked to judge with Mike Koreski and Brett Harbaugh. <clears throat> and we took our time tasting maybe 10 different chilies, maybe more than that, and it was awesome. Just goofing from chili to chili to chili, tasting each one, uh, and we decided that we were going to try them individually and rank them ourselves before we got together to rank them as a group. And I had a hard time with this. Okay? People who know me know not to trust my opinion on food or restaurants because every meal I eat is the best meal I've ever eaten. Okay? I'm just that kind of person. I like a little bit of everything. Okay? So there were two or three that I was most confident in. And they made the top of my list, and I felt good about it. There was one in particular I thought was the closest thing to Kevin Malone's famous chili from The Office possible. Okay, it was amazing. But as we started to gather together to judge these chilies, Mike jumped in before anybody could even say anything. Mike jumps in. He says, all right, guys, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before we get started, let's go ahead and knock one of these out. Okay, let's go ahead and agree that one of those chilies tasted like feet. Okay, it tasted like dirty socks, and it should immediately be disqualified and probably not served to any human beings here for the sake of their safety. It was, it was bad, I guess. I guess. I, I disagree. <laughs> so Brett and Mike said in unison, they both knew which one he was talking about. As they were gagging and shedding tears, they said, yes, chili number seven. It needs knocked out. And I'm sitting there shaking my head, and I'm agreeing, yeah, it was awful. And I peek down at my list alone, and I see that I had chili number seven ranked number two. <laughs> it was my second favorite chili of all of the chilies. But I immediately started to agree with Mike and Brett. And, and you know, I turned and erased my rankings and, and fixed them to where it, it matched Mike and Brett's rankings a little bit better, so it looked like theirs. Now, it was hard to judge that chili, but even more hard to figure out than chili is people. Mostly because what we tend to present on the outside doesn't really paint a very accurate picture of who we really are. We want to make good impressions and uh, for others to think the best about us. But in the process, we really don't allow others to know the real us. We mask ourselves with uh, different things. We mask up our insecurities and our flaws and our secret sins. And we pretend that everything is really much better than it actually is. And sometimes we become these church chameleons that can come in here and blend in right when we walk through these doors. And we pretend that everything's great when inside there is a major problem within all of us. And that problem is sin. During Jesus' ministry, we see he confronts a group of people that had everybody fooled. If you and I had been there, we probably would have judged them all wrong. They had everybody fooled by this beautiful and perfect outer shell and exterior. But what was beneath that exterior was absolutely disturbing. The religious leaders of Jesus' day, they were known as the scribes and the Pharisees. They were masters of creating a righteous and holy image on the outside. They would walk in the room, you know, very slowly and prominently so that everybody's eyes would turn to them. They had these long tassels flowing off their garments and they would bellow out these long, powerful prayers for everybody to hear. Always at the, the nicest banquets in the places of the highest honor. And we would probably have been intimidated and a little bit scared, maybe impressed and absolutely respectful of them because clearly these people are so spiritual, right? But Jesus saw right through the shiny outside, right into their hearts, that inside their hearts they were desperately wicked and motivated by all of the wrong things. Jesus said on the outside they did appear to be righteous, holy, in step with God, but beneath the surface was death. In Matthew 23, where we're going to be reading today, Jesus called them out for all of these things that they had been doing, all of this sin in their hearts. They had been placing these legalistic burdens on people that they themselves couldn't even bear. 
interpreting the law their own way and bending it to benefit them and make others struggle. All of their efforts of morality and obedience were simply to maintain this public perception of importance and power. That's all they cared about. They acted a certain way for reward and recognition, not because they loved God. While stressing minor details of the law, they missed out on the major things like doing justice, loving their neighbors, caring for the poor and oppressed people. They were good at looking righteous without actually being righteous. They preached, but they did not practice what they preached. And they could recite the law, but they did not love the law. It was all about this outward appearance. And the cost of maintaining a religious appearance is high. And Jesus did not hold back in his condemnation for these men. His righteous anger burned against their hypocrisy and their sin. We're going to start reading here in verse 25 if you're following along. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. In the Greek language, this word that Jesus used for hypocrites would have been translated as actors, stage players. You're an actor. You're a pretender. It would literally translate to interpreters from underneath, meaning underneath a mask they were pretending and they were speaking under these uh, shells and layers of costumes that they hid behind. He said, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites. You stage actors. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. See, the Pharisees thought they were crushing it, right? They thought they had it all together. They believed that they were very righteous, but Jesus says what they shared the most in common with was a whitewashed tomb, which looked beautiful and lovely on the outside, but within it was full of dead people's bones and defilement. In uh, Jewish culture, tombs were often whitewashed to be remarkably clean so that they would be noticeable. These tombs would have caught your eyes you were walking by, almost unbelievably bright and shiny, so that people could see where the tomb was so they wouldn't risk touching it, touching something unclean or dead and uh, defiling themselves and becoming ceremonially unclean. And the whitewashing made the tombs beautiful and easy to recognize, and they were attractive to the eye. It's like wearing shiny reflective gear for any of you runners in here so that people will see you and know to avoid you and not hit you. The whitewashed tombs that were these Pharisees and religious people were nice to look at. They were well presented, and they looked clean and smooth and presentable, but inside each of them was the bones of a dead man. Now, how many of you guys love a good Jesus burn? Okay, you like reading stuff like this, and it's like, oh my gosh, Jesus was pretty ruthless, right? He was confronting these people. This is an absolute roast. Now, I used to smirk and raise my eyebrows when I read this because I love Jesus confronting fake spiritual bullies. I love seeing a bully get taken down a notch. But as as I've come to understand my own sin... I feel these words cutting through my own hypocrisy. And we may typically respond to Scripture like this by feeling offended at other hypocrites we know. And we say, you know, yeah, that sounds like uh, this, this lady, and that sounds like all the other people in my church. But our, our proper response to this as we read this, when we understand we're sinners in need of grace as well, is to say, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with us? The same hypocrisy within them is within me as well. We are just as bent towards self-righteousness and hypocrisy, creating nice images of ourselves to present to everybody else, while what's underneath is ugly and it's sinful and it's wretched. 
The church today struggles with the same disease that the Pharisees were poisoned by. Hypocrisy. Believing that we are far less wicked and sinful than they really were. We spend so much effort, so much time creating an image to wear on the outside that doesn't align with the inner reality of our hearts. And the truth is that if you are without Christ, you are just sheltering a dead heart beneath fake beauty. Sin isn't necessarily what makes you a hypocrite. Sin is inevitable. We all sin. Sin is what makes you human. What makes us hypocrites is whitewashing the outside to tell the world that we're beautiful while death lies beneath the surface. The Pharisees had mastered this art of appearing to be spiritual, but their hearts were cold and lifeless and dead. What was presented on the outside was blanketing this, this uh, in disguising this heart that was characterized by death and wickedness and a major problem that they could not fix. So this morning, I want us to do some self-examination of our own, acknowledging our tendency to be nothing more than pretenders, stage actors, hypocrites, whitewashed tombs. And I want us to look at three truths that will prevent us from becoming that. The first thing this morning, we don't need our exterior whitewashed. We need our interior washed white. The inner reality for each of us is a dead heart that needs transformed by the grace of God. The inner reality of every heart is that it is either dead in sin or alive in Christ. There is no middle ground. The Bible says that we were all born under the curse of sin and that we're all wicked and sinful beyond our wildest imaginations. You're born into sin that separates you and drives you apart from God. And when we understand that we're sinful, we try to cover our sin typically with whatever we can do to mask up the real problem. Adam and Eve did this in the garden. When they rebelled against God and sin, what was the first thing they did when they realized they were broken and in sin? They covered themselves up. They covered their shamefulness to feel better about themselves. But inside of them, the storm of sin had already come and ruined everything. They didn't need these external layers to give them the illusion of safety and security. What they needed was rescue from sin. Sin that drove them out of the garden and into separation from God. You can cover up with all of the things in the world that make you feel secure and significant. You can try to, to become fixed and whole again by money and reputation and all these other things. And you can wear the mask to hide the ugly reality of your heart. But it needs cleansed. And that is a job only Jesus can do. The truth is you're just whitewashing the outside to look good with things that never really solve the real problem. You can make your life look appealing and respectable and whitewash it to be so bright and beautiful. But until you acknowledge that inside there are dead bones that need revived and you are in need of a savior, you'll never have what your soul is longing for. The Pharisees mastered this art of presenting the most beautiful surface with things they thought were important. But beneath the surface was a dead heart that needed deliverance from the captivity of sin. I love the image that Jesus used of the cup that was filthy and dirty on the inside, but beautiful on the outside. I had a psychology teacher in high school, one of the strangest dudes I've ever met. I, I don't think he's, he's listening right now, so I can say that. Very interesting guy. He used the same coffee mug every morning without washing it for like years. Does anybody in here, you're, you're probably not going to raise your hand now, but <laughs> there might be some people in here who do that as well. I don't know if there's some kind of secret to it or whatever, but he thought the leftover coffee residue just like kind of added to the next cup. Yeah, okay, I, I, sounds like you guys are agreeing with me, so I feel good moving forward with this. I thought it was disgusting. I didn't understand it at all. He thought it added to the next cup, but inside of this cup, it was stained brown from his constant cups of coffee, and the inside was never cleaned out. And on the outside, it was a great-looking coffee mug, right? It was beautiful. 
But on the inside, it was stained and dirty and unclean. Just imagine him uh, taking his time out of his day to grab a paper towel and just clean the outside a little bit. Polish it, you know, make sure it's, it's real clean and presentable. While the inside was dirty and stained and filthy. This is a picture of the Pharisees. They were stained and dirty inside, but they were so obsessed with their image on the outside instead. Now, I got another scenario for you, okay? Maybe you want to close your eyes and really lean into this for a second. Imagine you moved into a house. It was gorgeous, like absolutely beautiful. Picture your dream house. On the outside, it was beautiful. The neighbors would drive by it every day and just drop their jaws at the beautiful architecture, the stunning colors on it, the big wide windows that overlooked this vibrant garden. And everything was perfect and it was beautiful. But when you stepped inside, it was burned to ash and totally empty and broken. The inside is just dead, lifeless, dreary, and cold. It's unlivable. You could not spend your time in this house. Look, a restoration job from Chip and Joanna Gaines was out of the question. Okay? Like totally unfixable. It couldn't be fixed and it needed to be taken down and started over. But you move into the house anyway. Because that's just the kind of person you are, I guess. And the first thing you say is this. Honey... I think we really should consider adding another coat of paint on the shutters outside. It's not bright enough. It doesn't look impressive enough. And you know what would really impress the neighbors? Is if we put some azaleas in that garden. That'll get them. That'll fix this house. That's what we need. We need to keep putting on paints of coat, and we need to keep adding to the external image. That would be crazy. Right? We can all agree that's insane. The inside is broken beyond repair. So no matter how polished and neat the outside looked, the inside is dead. And you could pretend for the rest of the world that you had this amazing home and people would drive by it and say, wow, they've got it all together. It's so neat. It's so clean. But the inside is broken beyond reparation. The same is true of your heart. Our hearts apart from Christ are broken and dead and in need of a total resurrection. We can become whitewashed tombs if we want to. Glamorous and beautiful on the outside, but hopelessly dead and filled with bones that you could never bring to life. You can spend your life sculpting an image to appear beautiful on the outside while you ignore inner problems. And that sculpture is not going to do you any good when this life is past. You may need to ask yourself the question this morning. Is the constant polishing of my image and this beautiful presentation I give on the outside, is it worth neglecting where the real work needs done, which is in my heart? Tony Evans says, no matter how much you decorate the exterior of a grave, the inside still contains death. The truth is the state of your soul without dependence on Christ is that you are lost and dead and hopeless regardless of what the outside looks like, regardless of what you can convince everybody else is going on. You can pretend you have it all together. You can clothe yourself in your own righteous image, but your heart needs surgery that only God can perform. Your outward appearance doesn't need whitewashed and coated and shined and glitter added to it. Your interior needs to be washed white by the wave of God's grace that meets us when uh, Jesus takes our place on the cross. Only then will true beauty radiate to the outside, but it'll be out of delight in who God is and the abundance of love for Jesus. The gospel changes us from the inside out. Our second truth that we need to dwell on today is believing the gospel means abandoning self-sufficiency. Believing the gospel means abandoning self-sufficiency. We need to remember this. Dead hearts come alive by the power of the gospel alone. 
Not your works, not your best image, not your best efforts. Your greatest efforts to revive your soul have no power at all to change anything. And we never truly believe the gospel until we finally wave that white flag of surrender and acknowledge we can't fix ourselves. You are not sufficient enough to be your own savior. We try and try and try, and you can read through the Bible and see where people tried and tried over again to do it, but they always would fall. They always would fail. We cannot be good enough on our own. Beneath every display of your best efforts to be righteous, to be good, in your own power is dead bones that have no hope of true life. The Pharisees thought their own moral and religious performances put them in right standing with God. And we face the same temptation today. See, self-sufficiency can make you look good on the outside for a little while. But you can only be changed from the inside out by an experience with God's grace. As much as you can try and uh, strive to earn God's favor and his love, your self-sufficient efforts lead to cycles of despair and hopelessness because you're never going to achieve that. Paul writes in Romans 3 that there is no one righteous apart from God and that all have sinned and fall short of his glory. So as hard as you may try to be good, to do better, to sin less, and to achieve righteousness on your own, you'll only find failure and despair. Every effort to earn God's favor by your own work is essentially whitewashing the tomb of a dead man. It might create a clean and crisp outside without ever having the power to raise those dead bones back to life. One of the greatest tips I've ever been given in my life, when I'm tempted to base my position with God on my own works, to preach the gospel to myself every single day. I want to encourage you to do the same thing. Preach the gospel to yourself every day. Become so saturated in that message. Because the gospel says righteousness is not earned, it is given to you as a gift. I don't need my righteousness, I need the righteousness of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it's my favorite verse in all of scripture. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. His substitutionary death on the cross paid my sin debt, and in exchange, he handed me all of his righteousness. You don't need the righteousness of yourself today. You need the righteousness of Christ. Righteousness that can't be earned, but righteousness that is gifted to you. Preach this to yourself daily. We cannot move past the gospel message. It is everything when you find yourself trying to be good enough on your own to cover your sin with these superficial layers of good works and good deeds and your own goodness, stop. Preach the gospel to yourself. You can't be good enough on your own. Lean into Christ. Depend on the finished work that he did on the cross for you. Most religions say, do more. Do this. Do that. A lot of people say that most religions are do religions, while the gospel is, uh, Christianity is a done religion. The gospel says the work has been done. Now rest in the finished work of Jesus, not in your own work. Martin Luther talked about this issue of works righteousness, trying to be good enough on your own by saying that our hearts are hardwired for works righteousness. Meaning we believe deep down that we, uh, what we do determines how God feels about us. This is a lie that we need to recognize and kill. The gospel teaches righteousness gifted to you, not earned by you. The gospel says if you are in Christ, there is nothing you could do to make him love you more or less because you've accepted righteousness as a gift, not something you earned by your own merit. If you are in Christ, the the righteousness of Christ has been bestowed upon you. And when God sees you, he sees his perfect son. 
Only when the gospel takes root in our hearts will we learn to depend on his grace, not just to save us, but to sustain us, to carry us. That's something you can't do for yourself. Lean into him. Trust him. See, the Pharisees, the whitewashed tombs, they were so dependent on their own righteousness. And every deed done in vain was like painting another coat on the outside of a dead man's tomb. And they could add more decoration and they could put the glitter and the shine on the outside and make it look gorgeous. And uh, every work of their own that they trusted in was just another coat, but it was never enough. They needed the grace of God to bring their hearts to life. There's no longer a need to be self-sufficient. When Jesus' atoning sacrifice was sufficient enough, rest in that. Rest in the work of Christ alone, not your own works. And third and lastly today, we need a commitment to intimacy and authenticity. If we're going to avoid this hypocritical status, becoming a whitewashed tomb that looked beautiful on the outside, but was full of dead man's bones, we need to commit to intimacy and authenticity with God and with each other. I want to beg you today, whoever you are, whoever is listening, to see your need for an inner cleansing over an outward masking. To see your need to be totally real and vulnerable with God this morning. It's only when we give our full selves to God that we can find a true intimate relationship with the Father. Intimacy is only found in authentic relationships that aren't masked in pretending to be something else. Intimacy is when I know somebody as they really are, the true them the true colors, the real person behind the act. When I can open up and show 100% of who I am to somebody in total vulnerability. See, if we're honest with ourselves, we're really good at giving everybody around us about 95% of ourselves. Maybe even 98. If you're a little more honest with people than the next person. But we rarely ever give our full selves to people. Maybe you can recognize that in yourself right now, that the person you are right now sitting in that pew is not the same person that you're going to be in two hours when you walk into the comforts of your own home. Very rarely do we give our full selves, our real authentic selves to each other. We cannot have intimacy with God and with each other when we fail to do that. It's not enough to just give 95% of ourselves. See, each of us in our hearts is longing to be fully known and fully loved, exactly for who you are. That's the relationship that Jesus died to give you access to. That's what God is desiring in you. I recently heard it said this way, that the million-dollar question of Christianity that the gospel answers is this. What is it like to be fully exposed in all of our mess and all of our sin and shame in the presence of God? The answer is it's safe. The answer is that Jesus looked through the mess of your sin and saw a soul that was worth dying for. And you can pretend even to God himself that you have it all together. Why do we do that? I catch myself when I go to pray to the Father. I'm acting like I'm somebody else, like I'm not struggling with the things that I'm struggling with. God knows my heart. And you can pretend, but you're not fooling him. And he's the one person in the universe that knows the depths of your sin, but yet loves you with this intense, unbelievable love that you will never be able to get your head around. It's the most safe place to be. See, whitewashed tombs were made clean on the outside to warn people, right, of the death and the defilement beneath the surface so we could stay away. But Jesus saw that tomb that you were in. Jesus saw that tomb that I was in, and he walked into it in our place, taking death and defilement upon himself on the cross so that I could be made pure and clean. 
Jesus came to take that defilement and death upon himself so that you could be clean and righteous in his place. Nothing else could take the dirtiness of your sin and the death inside of you and give you a new heart. But Jesus would walk right into your tomb and say, I see the brokenness. I see the dirty reality. I see the mess inside of you. And I see a heart that needs transformed by my grace. So stop pretending. Lean into me. Trust me as your source of redemption and saving. I'll take the sin and the death for you, and I'll make you righteous. It's scary to have an intimate relationship, isn't it? It's frightening to think that people could know uh, the the secrets and the, the dark crevices of our life and those things that we hide. And it's scary to have an intimate relationship with God because we know we're sinful. We know we're so unworthy, but he welcomes the real you to come and accept him and leave changed. To experience his grace and his love in a way that changes you from the inside out. Would you pray today with me for the courage to enter an intimate and authentic fellowship with God and with your local church community? Could we be so bold to take our masks off to get out of these costumes, stop pretending to say, this is the real me. I'm broken. I'm messy. I'm dirty. And I need a savior just like everyone else. Your heart is dead. And it's only hope for life lies in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So let those walls down and trust Jesus with your whole self. Every head's bowed and eyes closed this morning. It's easy to become a whitewashed tomb. So focused on the outside that we never acknowledge the desperate problem within us. Your image and your exterior does not need more washing. You don't need to add more coats of paint. You don't need to clean it and make it shinier. Don't neglect the real problem, which is your need for a savior, your need for a new heart, your need to be brought back to life. Maybe this is the morning that you take the mask off, you uh, step out of that costume and you become real with yourself, with God and with others hey, I don't need whitewashed on the outside anymore. I need washed white on the inside. Maybe you need to stop relying on your own goodness and your own works. And you need to rest in the finished work of Jesus. You could not do enough on your own to earn God's favor and love. Jesus did it for you. Righteousness is a gift that you can accept not something you have to earn. Maybe you acknowledge this morning that you have a dead heart. And as good as you've looked on the outside, it's time to deal with the inside. That you have a heart that needs a touch by God's grace heard it said before that Jesus came not to make bad people good but to bring dead hearts to life if you've never trusted in Jesus with your full self if you've never given him your life your heart is dead and needs a savior you can accept him this morning Jesus in your place. That's the gospel message. Jesus in my place. The 
truth is that all of us are sinners. We're all trapped under the curse of sin. And we needed a way out. We needed a rescue. And Jesus stepped down from heaven to become human. And he lived the perfect life that you couldn't live and died the death that you deserved in your place. And the truth is, all sin will be punished. But it's up to you how it's punished. All sin is either punished uh, through Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross, or it'll be punished by yourself for eternity. Stop depending on yourself. Trust in Jesus this morning. Maybe you've never done that. You've never accepted Jesus Christ. You can make that decision this morning. And it's not some magic prayer that you have to say word for word. It's a matter of the posture of your heart and humility saying, God, I accept your grace. I accept this free gift of salvation. I accept your righteousness in my place and I'm trusting you with my life. You could pray something like this this morning. God, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I needed rescue. I believe that you paid the price for my sin for me. I want you to save me and be the Lord of my life. And if you prayed something like that this morning, if you trusted Jesus for the first time, we'd love to celebrate that with you. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to talk to you about uh, some next steps in your faith. You can reach us. Uh, I'd just love for you to send me an email or a text message, jweddle at clarksburgbaptistchurch.com. Or you can message Pastor Phil at pwayman at clarksburg clarksburgbaptistchurch.com we'd love to talk to you about that decision that you made I want to challenge you to continue to respond to God however he's dealing with your heart this morning continue to pray or stand and worship with us as we lift our voices to the king
Amen. Are you glad you came to church this morning? You may be seated. We wanted to uh, remind you guys before you left, continue to RSVP. If you want to be here on Sunday mornings, um, do it every week. RSVP. If you RSVP once, it doesn't lock you a spot for all Sundays in the future. We need to know that you want to be here. So call the church office, email the church office, and RSVP. Uh, you can email us or uh, just text us or call us or let us know, and we'll get you down for each week. Don't forget about our kids' cookout, which is this Saturday. And also, I wanted to encourage you, find some of those graduating seniors, unless they're mad at me for calling them out to, to give them attention, but uh, find some of those people, even if you don't do it in person right now, uh, shoot them a text, shoot them a message, encourage them, and let them know how proud you are of them. Um, we have an awesome group of graduating seniors who were uh, saying goodbye to you right now, but uh, I know God has huge plans for them in the next steps of their lives, um, wherever they go, and also within the church, because God has gifted them with so many different talents and, and things like that, and uh, we're just so excited for what's to come for all of them. Uh, we're going to go ahead and say goodbye to our live stream. If you joined us this morning, we're so thankful that we had you. Uh, we hope to see you again next week, either online again or in person. We want you to know that we love you so much, and we'll see you then.